Hello, everyone, and welcome to our final episode of the high school edition of Explore Classroom. My name is Kim Young, and I'm a high school world history teacher, and I'm also a National Geographic Education Fellow. Thank you all for joining us throughout this season. Today, I'll be your host. At National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration, wonder, and storytelling to change the world. We believe that everyone of every identity and experience should be able to safely explore the wonder of our world. We stand in support of human dignity, respect, and justice. Thank you to all who've joined us over the last couple of months. We have had an amazing lineup of explorers, but we've also had amazing participation from students from all across the world. Um, our first episode kicked off with Tomas, who really challenged us to think about individual stories behind headlines and who are writing the stories that we're reading in the news. Lo Song then challenged us to think about how we should take actions as individuals and highlighted the importance of listening and working with and not for local communities. John joined us in the middle of the night from Hong Kong with the most choral enthusiasm I have ever seen and taught me about something I knew nothing about. Um, Daniela told us about a history that we're often under, unfamiliar with in the U.S. and Canada and connected to the indigenous um, Indian boarding schools and residential schools. Um, and how about, as it's just as important to know history, it's also important to know the resilience and joy of communities. Finally, earlier this week, Ifatu joined us from Nigeria and to told us about her process of using curiosity to learn about the lesser known stories in our own communities and countries. And that brings us to, to today, our finale. And that means it is totally awesome and exciting, but it also means it's almost summer, which is also really exciting. Um, and today we are being joined by National Geographic Explorer, Trish Marker. She is absolutely amazing. I've totally enjoyed getting to know her over the last couple months as we've been preparing um, this program. But she is a PhD candidate in anthropology at Binghamton University, and she's focusing on historical archaeology and linguistic anthropology. Among many things, she's a lab director, a curator, a, re a lecturer, a student, and recently she got some really great news that she'll be completing her dissertation as a 2020 Mellon ACLS dissertation competition fellow. Finally, a couple of shout outs, truly a global program today. We've got students joining us from all over the United States, Canada, and Lebanon. And with that, Trish, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Take it away. Hey, wow, what an introduction. Thank you so much, Kim. And I'm so excited to be here doing the Explorer Classroom today. Um, it looks like, yep, there we go. Um, that was just such a great introduction. And wow, what a lineup to, to follow. And I feel like I already am seeing some threads through all of these different programs that the Explore Classroom has done. So I'm really excited to be here um, talking about archaeology and my work today. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we're going to get started. Uh, let's see, share screen. Um, let me do this, share. And you look good. All right, I've got a thumbs up. So my name is Trish Markert. Um, Kim has told you a little bit about me. So what I'm hoping to talk to you about today um, is sort of just some basics of archaeology. We're going to hit the main points, a little bit about what I do, um, and then kind of the central point, why archaeology matters today and why we talk about the past. How do we construct history? And how does this really impact and kind of create a foundation for the issues that we deal with in the present? Um, so we have a lot to cover. Um, I do have some notes here because I tend to go a little bit long. So you might see me looking down, um, but I'm really looking forward to our conversation and the discussion afterwards. Please ask questions. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to discussing this with you. So just to give you a little brief background on me, Kim has done such a great job. Um, but I am a historical archaeologist. I've been doing archaeology for about 10 years. Uh, a lot of people ask how I became involved in archaeology, and it was actually um, an interest that I developed as a high school student, like you. I was interested in old things and in stories and in reading about people and places. I had a lot of questions, and so that all coalesced in an interest in anthropology, which is the study of people, of human beings. So, 
I uh, majored in that at Temple University where I went for undergrad and I've worked at a lot of different archaeological sites over the past 10 years. Um, there's just a few photos that you can see here. I've worked in Peru um, at the African American site of Timbuktu in New Jersey. And there's a couple photos here of me starting to work in Texas under my dissertation advisor, Dr. Ruth Van Dyke, at a historic house site uh, in Castroville. So that's actually what brought me to Texas, but I'll be talking to you a little bit more about my own work, which looks at um, migration and how migrations um, kind of inform the places that we create through time in, in different and sometimes very surprising ways. Um, it's worth noting too, also to tag back to, to Kim's introduction, that uh, a lot of the work that I do is not in the field, and that's true of many archaeologists. So I do a lot of work in archaeology labs. We need to process the artifacts that we dig, the samples that we take, and so that happens in labs. Um, I also do quite a bit with museums and with teaching. Um, so I'm very excited to be here. This is, this is a really great thing to be able to do right now. So that's enough about me. What I'd like to do is first start with the basics. I don't know how many people have taken a class in archaeology. A lot of different folks bring different experiences to the table when we're talking about archaeology. So let's actually just start with a really basic question. What is archaeology? Um, and maybe an even better way to start, because there's a lot of um, different conceptions out there about what archaeology is, and some of them tend to be misconceptions. Um, it might be better to start by talking about what is archaeology not. And there's two main things I want to hit here. Um, normally, if you were in the classroom with me, I would ask you to jot some stuff down, what comes to mind when you think about archaeology. Um, but I'm just going to ask you to hold that in your head right now. And the first thing I'm going to bring up, some of you may be anticipating this, is this guy. Um, archaeologists do not do dinosaurs. That is paleontologists. Um, we excavate in some similar ways. They are neighbors in science, um, but we do not study dinosaurs. And I apologize to anyone who joins today hoping for some dinosaur action. I don't have that, but I hope you stick with us anyway, um, because archaeology is doing some pretty cool stuff. The next sort of main public image, one of the most popular archaeologists in the world, is this guy, who many of you might be familiar with, um, Dr. Jones. Uh, and I don't know how many high schoolers are watching Indiana Jones today. You should. It's a great movie, but it is not a good representation of what we do as archaeologists. Um, in fact, in this sort of famous opening sequence, um, Indiana breaks almost every single rule of archaeology. Um, we're not protecting the site. We're not working with communities. Um, it's definitely not a safe work environment. So uh, th this is not representative of us. Um, an archaeologist actually in this situation would not be interested in the gold idol. We'd be a lot more interested in the people that created this place. We'd be like, why um, is it so important to protect this idol to this particular community? What technologies did they use to create these booby traps? Um, where did they learn those? Are there other sites that are like this? We would be asking questions and taking a lot of steps to preserving this site um, instead of kind of trying to get the shiny object and then get out while the whole thing crashes down around you. So again, great movie representative of what archaeology is not. But moving on to what is archaeology. Um, I don't expect you all to be experts in archaeology uh, coming out of this or coming into it. But there are two main points that I'd like us to sort of set for the foundation here. The first is that archaeology studies people um, through their material worlds that they create and the material remains they leave behind. So you can see the definition from the Society for American Archaeology here. Um, so it's about people. It's about not the things, but the people that have used them and created them, learning about past lives. Archaeology is also a scientific discipline. So this is why what Indiana Jones did is not in line with what we do today. Uh, we have research questions. We follow scientific methods. We are data driven. We collect data to answer those research questions. So archaeology is a science and it's very committed to doing things properly and professionally in order to preserve the past. So those are two bits about archaeology that I want you to keep in mind. But I'd like to make one additional point about archaeology, which is that it's not just about the distant past. I think a lot of us think archaeology, um, and we connect to ancient civilizations, and certainly some amazing archaeologists are working on those sites and those questions. But there's archaeologists who study the recent past too. Um, I'm a historical archaeologist, 
And we're generally understood to, have, to be studying what we would call the modern world. That's about the past 500 years, the era of colonialism, the advent of capitalism, um, globalization, that type of thing. The world changed rapidly. Um, and we usually are able to work with historical documents as well. And there are some archeologists that study the present uh, and they're known as contemporary archeologists. They're studying right now, today, the things that happened yesterday or 50 years ago. So there's a lot of fascinating work happening in many different um, areas on many different kind of topics and time periods. But there is one sort of central takeaway. So that's what archeology span is. But one of the main points that I want to make and I would say this for any archaeology class that you take in your life. One of the main takeaways should be this, that the past is a force that shapes the present. It's incredibly important. It's literally the foundation for, for everything that's happening today. And there's three main points that I want to, to make here. The first is that history, when we think about it, it's a thing that we create. It's a thing that we make. History isn't just what happened in the past. It is something that we make decisions about today the past is messy. Lots of things have happened. There's a lot of different experiences and people and lives. History picks and chooses them and puts them into a story. Um, but doing that, it has a lot of power, right? So you've probably heard the saying that history is written by the victors, but maybe a more appropriate way of thinking about it is that history is written by people who have power. And that traditionally is very few people. And so a lot of lives and stories get left out of history as we understand it traditionally. Um, so that's an important thing for archaeologists to address. Second, I want to highlight that history is not over, but it's ongoing, right? There's no moment, except for maybe right this second, where the past ended and the present began. Um, so it's important for us as archaeologists and then also for, I think, us as just global citizens to recognize how the events of the past connect directly to the present. It's not like chapters have ended and have closed. Instead, we're still building these stories. We're active participants. And then finally, the way we choose to write our history reflects the future that we want to see. So it's important to look at the past and to create a more equitable past or a more inclusive past if we want to see a more equitable and inclusive future. So I'm going to come back to that. But those are the three points that I want to make sort of in this central sort of the this this thing at the heart of this talk. This matters for archeology span because our job is to learn about the past. Um, and because by looking at the material record, think about all the things you collect around you that you use. If an archeologist were to look at those, they could tell a lot about your life. Um, and so we're able to tell a lot about the lives of people in the past. We can fill in some of those gaps uh, that are left out of written records and learn about lives that weren't necessarily included in history. But this also means that we have the responsibility to communities to include voices other than our own, right? Um, and this is important because if you remember, writing history is a form of power. And if we're the only ones doing it, we're not necessarily addressing that issue of creating a more inclusive past. Um, so we work hard to include communities in our work and make that past multivocal, multiple voices. Uh, we've not always been good at this. Actually, it's pretty recent that we've even started considering ways of doing it. I would say the past three or four decades. Um, I'm going to give you a quick assignment. I'm only going to leave this up for a second. But anyone who wants to jot these down, I encourage you to look up NAGPRA, the Native American Grave Protection and Repatriation Act, and the African Burial Ground, two really seminal moments in the 1990s that have to do with our accountability to communities. Um, so if anyone wants to Google these after the talk, there's a lot of information out there on them. And I encourage you to read up a little bit more on them. But it's important for us to co-create knowledge. That's the point here. And there's some amazing projects doing this. I'm highlighting a few here. I wish I could get into each and every one, um, but I can't. So take a look. We can return to this in the questions. But check out their websites. They're doing amazing work. Um, we do community archaeology, collaborative archaeology, where we involve communities at every stage of the research. Um, we include methods like oral history, where we literally listen to the stories that people have to tell and include that in, in our knowledge of the past. Uh, and we do things like participatory research. So there's a lot to look into here, um, but I just want to make everyone aware that this is sort of a movement um, and a set of methods and a commitment that exists in archaeology today. So. With that, we are going to move on to my work in Texas. Um, I also do community archaeology. I have 
sort of a long history of doing this. One of the first projects I worked on was a community archaeology project. And so it's very important to me to work with community members um, from the ground up, from when we figure out research questions and research sites, um, to you know, the interpretation of those materials and presenting it to the public. So let me give you some brief background on Dehennis and Castorville, the two towns where I work in Texas. And I don't know if we have anyone joining us from Castorville or Dehennis. I sent some notes around, but um, if you are, hi, I'm so excited to have you here. Okay, so just some brief background. This is where I get really wordy, so I am going to force myself to look a little more at my notes because you guys don't want to listen to me talk about this for 30 minutes. So my research sites are two towns in Texas to the west of San Antonio. You can see them here. They're called Castorville and Tejenes, and they were both actually settled in the 1840s uh, when about 2,000 people migrated to Texas from Alsace, which is a long, thin region between France and Germany. Um, I'm going to show you a quick thing. You can see the red uh, on the map here is the region of Alsace in the present day country of France. And from the open source image, you can see a little bit about their architecture and what, what this place looks like. So to go back to this, um, these two communities were settled by Alsatians, but there were also others there as well, people who migrated from Germany, from Poland, from Mexico. Um, and in fact, for those of you that know the history of Texas, um, Texas had been a part of Mexico not all that long ago. So at the time that this was happening in the early 1840s, Texas was actually an independent country. It had just declared its independence from Mexico um, less than a decade before. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the American Southwest and even further north was a part of Mexico and before that New Spain for centuries before it became the United States. So these are parts of history that's important for us to know. Um, this area was also home to many indigenous groups like the Kiowa, Lipan Apache, um, more recently the Comanche, for millennia, for thousands of years. And it's important to know the stories of, of them as well and also how uh, they were forced out of these ancestral lands by targeted Western expansion practices. And while we can't get into that now, it's another aspect of this that I really encourage you to research and look up on your own. So we have these two towns. Um, interestingly too, people actually uh, spoke Alsatian in both of these towns until the mid 19th century. So in Texas, they were speaking a language. It sounds a lot like German. Uh, and there are still a few speakers that are alive today that can speak Alsatian with you if you were to visit, which I have done. So Castorville is called the Little Alsace of Texas. Um, it, is, it celebrates its Alsatian heritage. Um, when you visit, you'll see this Alsatian townhouse. This is actually an Alsatian townhouse. It was disassembled in Alsace and shipped to Texas in around the year 2000 and rebuilt. Um, so that's an interesting heritage tidbit. You also see these traditional stone cottages built by the early settlers. There's bakeries and, and restaurants that feature Alsatian foods. There's an Alsatian festival, which was unfortunately canceled because of COVID-19 this year. Now, Dehennis, um, is about 30 miles further up the road. So they're not that far apart, but it looks a little bit different. It looks like this. Um, and I think most of us recognize this as sort of a more American style railroad town. It's a historic railroad town um, with a classic American main street. Uh, and there's a good reason for this. It's because in 1880, the railroad came through here and most of the residents of the Alsatian settlement actually moved the town a mile and a half away uh, to the railroad where there was more traffic, more commerce. So Old Stehenis, the original settlement actually is about a mile and a half southeast. And this is an image from there. Um, it has a lot of ruins. Um, there's not many good maps of it. And this is actually where I conducted my field work. I was really interested in knowing what the original Alsatian migrants were doing, um, how they were creating space, how they were making a new place um, now that they had left their home and traveled somewhere new. Um, so we were looking at Old Dehennis. This here is St. Dominic's Church, which is now a ruin, but was the original Catholic church of that community. So first, um, many of you probably know the main method that archeologists use, it's excavation, we dig. I actually was not digging during this project. I used a lot of other methods. And I think this highlights that archeologists do use many other methods. Um, in their work. We don't need to excavate to learn about the past. Um, in fact, I was studying seven, there's only six pictured here because one is actually still a residence, 
um, ruin, uh, old houses that had been these, in this case, ruins that dated to that early settlement period. Um, I was interested in recording these and learning about some of the choices that the original Alsatians were making. Um, by looking at these, I wanted to understand what those choices were and then compare and contrast them to New Dehennis after the railroad came through and also the neighboring town of Castroville and its original layout. So again, this is sort of asking research questions, comparing and contrasting to learn about the past. So with that all in mind, I'm gonna go through some of the methods that I used um, for our research. And I'm still working on analysis, so I don't have the final results for you yet, but this will give you a sense of what I as an archeologist do in my work. So first I did a lot of archival research. This included scanning documents, um, original photographs, uh, doing research in libraries and archives and online. Um, this is a big part of what archeologists do. We need to do the background research before going to the field. This is my field crew. Eventually we went out to do the archeology. span um, So shout out to these guys. Uh, they were absolutely amazing. Um, but when we got to the field, after doing all that background research, we were faced with the challenge of documenting these ruins. So first we had to clear them of vegetation. So I don't think we usually think about leaf blowers and chainsaws and hedge clippers as archeological tools, but they were what we used to really clear away the vegetation from these ruins when we arrived at them. Um, so this is just a before and after photo to give you a sense of what that actually looked like. Uh, it was a lot of work. They did a great job. We then recorded context. So we wanted to record what was happening in each room of the house in each outdoor area. So um, each member of the crew would map those areas. They would record, um, take photographs in order to get a sense of what the space looked like. We would photograph surface finds, which are artifacts that lay on the surface to get a sense of those types of things, though we did not collect them. We have the record. And in fact, um, I'll point at this one on the left here. If anyone wants to try to guess what that is, it's sort of our mystery artifact on hand. So let's see if we get any good guesses. Um, is it a waffle? It's not a waffle, um, but it's, it's, the idea is correct. So uh, it is kitchen related. Yeah, see if we get any, any keep the food thing in mind. Okay, um, so we documented artifacts on the surface that we found. Then we completed architectural drawings. We wanted to get the architectural aspects of what was going on in these buildings, how people were building them. And there's actually a lot of really interesting things uh, about how uh, some of the early Alsatian migrants decided and knew how to build buildings. So we're really looking into those. Um, we did what we call elevation drawings. So we would string tape measures out and then measure up and down and mark dots on graph paper to get good scaled drawings of what these buildings looked like. This is a, a method used by a lot of architectural historians and historic preservationists. And something it might look like this at the end. Um, it gives us a sense of where stones were placed and how things were constructed. Finally, we digitally mapped the space and we did this in a few different ways. Um, I did use what we call a Trimble, a handheld um, GPS unit to take different points so that I can create a digital map in the computer. Uh, but we also used a process called photogrammetry, which is increasingly popular in archeology. span And it allows us to create 3D models just using thousands of photographs uh, and a program called Agisoft Metashape that used to be PhotoScan. So this is just an example of some of um, what turned up for us as we did this. I would walk around the structure and take thousands of pictures, my arms in the air, and then I would crouch down. It was a workout, but it turned out really well. And so you can see here, one of our structures and then the actual 3D, this is a dense point cloud. So it's millions of points um, that are colored to look like the, the building. And I can then add a photo mesh over that. Um, this is neat because it allows us to revisit the site digitally. I can go back, I can examine it, measure it, um, map it on my computer after leaving the field. So we use a lot of technology in our work too. And I can also use this to share it with people who can't necessarily get to these sites for different, um, you know, for different reasons. So that was the archeology, span but I'm gonna talk briefly about a few other ways that I actually do bring um, other methods into my work, particularly I'd like to talk about oral history because this ties into that idea of co-creating knowledge. And I didn't have a chance to speak too much about this earlier, but 
Um, I mean, the selection of Old Stehenis and the selection of the sites, that all happened in conversation with many community members over the, the past three or so years. Um, but in addition to this, I conducted a big oral history program. I recorded over 25 interviews with residents of Castorville and Tehennis and the surrounding area. Um, some of them is, you know, up there in years, 99, 100 years old, who remember the early 20th century and can bring those stories to life, right? Um, it's a very special thing when we can bring oral history and connect it to archaeology because it adds that sort of richness of lived experience that no matter how much expertise we have as archaeologists, we can't uncover from the material past. So I was really, really um, fortunate and lucky to be able to do this as part of my research. Uh, and it turned into many really wonderful relationships, people who became great collaborators and friends. You can see some of the um, technology that I use for that here. We can come back to that in the questions if you'd like. I also used a method called participatory mapping. Um, stories don't just happen in time. You don't just tell them, but they happen in space. And I wanted to get a sense of where these stories about the past were happening. So we held a few participatory mapping workshops. I invited everyone. Usually we would have sometimes up to 60 people there. Uh, I laid out big maps and people were invited to mark down important places and events, um, things that were important to them on those maps. And then we had a chance to talk about it sort of collectively as a group. So it was actually a really fun exercise. Uh, it brought a lot of people together and it allowed me to place some of these stories on the landscape, which is a large part of what I'm interested in doing as an archeologist. I'm happy to answer more questions about these methods um, at, the, at the end of the talk. And we are wrapping up now, I'm coming to my conclusion. Um, so it's, it's, this is again, sort of a juxtaposition of the two towns, but it is um, really important to me as an archeologist to understand the rich and interesting history and the picture of what life was like in these communities um, through time, right? From that original Alsatian migration until today. So that was part of, part of the goal of all of this. And it's something that I've really enjoyed working with the community on and that I continue to work with the community on. So what I wanna do now is circle back to that question of why these conversations matter. How does archeology span connect with present day issues, right? Um, and I'm gonna first start by addressing a little bit about my work on migration, um, just very briefly. Now, studying the migration in the past, um, like the Alsatian migration to Texas, it reminds us how movement impacts lives, landscapes, places, and histories. So as human beings, we are constantly on the move. That's always been true. Um, we're constantly making places that are important to us, that connect different places and people together across space. And like I said, that's true in the past, but it's also true in the present. And this is one of the main ways we shape our world. So it's important for us to learn about it in the past and connect those experiences and ideas and movements to the present and recognize that it's all part of an ongoing network that we're all a part of. It's also important to ask ourselves the hard questions. So why are some migrations viewed differently than others, right? And that, those are things that we have to unpack both in my work as an archeologist, but just as, as a society. Um, and how does this impact people as they try to make places and homes today? So that's a little bit on my research, but the way I'd like to end is actually addressing one of the most pressing matters today. So in particular, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, because archeology span has actually really come out with some really wonderful statements on this. And I think it highlights exactly how archeology span does connect to the present, how we are concerned with, with these things today. We don't just study the past. So, I know people will come to this with different ideas and perspectives and experiences. So let's acknowledge that. But what I'd like to say is that the understanding of the past is a big part of making a better future. I've touched on this already. So creating an anti-racist past, and that's one that rejects the ideas that have been ugliest in our society. I think that's something all of us can get behind. Um, it's not a political project, but it's an ethical and a human project. And it's something that I think we just simply should strive for. It's something that we can all do. And I want to um, show you that archeology, span even though it's generally seen as the discipline of the past is really deeply and directly connected to these issues. So each of the major archeological societies have released statements about this. And I have screenshots of them on the screen here. It's much too much text for you to read or for me to read out loud in the time that we have, but it gives you a sense of some of our commitments. As, as professionals that study the past. And I would um, really encourage you to look these up and read them because I think that they raise some really important questions 
and uh, bring to bear some really important issues for all of us, not just archaeologists. So the point here is that um, there's work that we can do, right? As archaeologists and as students and as anyone, I pitch this to anyone who is watching this. So in terms of thinking about the past, like read more about it, do the research, right? Include more voices, not less. Always seek perspectives other than your own. Recognize how the past is the foundation that the present is built on. Um, we need a solid foundation. So this is work that we can be doing. And um, to leave you all today with sort of a call to action, but also maybe a route for further um, exploration of these ideas and topics, um, I would encourage everyone to do this for themselves. Um, but you can support organizations that are at the forefront of this work. Um, the Society for Black Archaeologists or Society of Black Archaeologists, um, Archaeology in the Community, who I've already highlighted once in this talk, brings archaeology education to kids in particular in DC. Um, so there are places to go, places to donate, but more importantly, places to read up on the type of work that's being done um, and kind of broaden your ideas about the past. Um, so again, I'm happy to answer more questions about any of this in the discussion. But um, finally, for you dinosaur folks that have hung in there, um, this is a photo of the recently discovered and fantastically preserved nodosaur. And that's all I know about it because it is still not archaeology, but it is really cool. Um, and I have so many people to thank. I have it on the slide here, but I want to get to questions. Um, and it has been such a pleasure to do this talk and share all of this with you today. So thank you. Trish, thank you so much for that. Uh, if you can, I'll let you kind of stop sharing your screen and um, I'll yes. give a little so, so that we um, can highlight um, your answers as right. through the Q&A. So you've laid down the gauntlet and so many good questions for students to really engage with in so many different ways, mm -hmm. whether it's about methods of archeology, span your specific research, path to archeology, span and also our, the relevance of archeology span today. Um, so I'd love it for those of you guys who are joining us on YouTube, start put, um, putting some of those questions in the chat. Also, if you have any good guesses about what the waffle is, um, we'll, we'll bug Trish at the end for you know, some of the ideas or what's been going on with that. Um, but as we kind of wait for some of those ideas to be generated, um, I'm wondering what drove you to your specific research in that region of Texas? Was it the opportunity, kind of a chance, it, um, to get involved in that site or was it something you already knew about and had kind of wanted to go towards? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, and I get asked that question a lot by people in Texas because I'm clearly not a Texan. I mean, I'm sure anyone who's Texan on here can tell by my accent right away. Um, but how did I get there is such a great question. Um, so I've always been really committed to historical archaeology. I love working with communities. Oral history has always been one of my main methods. So um, coming to my dissertation research, I had those things in mind. And I did come to Binghamton University to join on the Texas project with Dr. Van Dyke, my advisor. But I didn't know what my role in that would be yet coming to it. Um, I had yet to visit the place. And so I actually took me close to two years of talking to people down there, getting to know the communities, attending community events. I went ranching one time, um, you know, just, just participating in life um, to really realize what the questions were. And I think that's important because it was sort of emergent um, from my relationship building with, with the communities. Um, this question of placemaking and migration and heritage uh, and how it displays in different ways and how it matters to people today. So um, I did know the basics of what I wanted to do methodologically, but the questions really came out of sort of a, a collaborative context with folks in Texas. Yeah, well, I think that's a great, so you had some of an idea, but yeah, with anything in life, things are gonna change and evolve and you have to Always. go to the place and get involved in the local community to really know yes. um, what you're gonna ask. Always. Um, Mm -hmm. Next question is from Cindy, um, and she'd like to know, how do you go about getting permissions to mm -hmm. kind of investigate these properties, either in these two specific instances or kind of in general, because that's also an important ethical question. Yes. Oh my gosh. Great question. Um, and I, I, Cindy, if you want to message me, I could talk about this with you at such length. Um, anyone can DM me on Instagram. You guys have, have my Instagram, I think. Um, but that's a really important question and it, it's complicated because it, it's different um, depending on where you are. Now, where we were working were private properties. And so I actually have a really good relationship with the property owner, Haida Polo Rodriguez. Um, he's amazing and has been a huge collaborator in all of this. 
but actually all the ruins that we worked on were on private property. So it was a negotiation between me and the property owner. Um, in some cases, those permissions need to be different. If you're working in, you know, with the national parks, if you're working on um, federal or state property. Um, and we weren't actually digging. So there's actually a whole nother set of permissions that you need to actually excavate. We were just recording. So we were leaving nothing behind. And it's not quite as stringent of a process as if you are going to excavate. So depending on your state, if you want to start an excavation, you actually need to go through a permitting process based on the rules of that state. So um, there is a lot of paperwork and it is an ethical question. Um, I'll address really quickly too, just very briefly that that's for the sites, but we also need really important permissions for the oral histories. Uh, we need to go through an informed consent process. We need to talk about whether or not people want their names on them, what's gonna to happen to them permanently. Um, and there's sort of a body at universities called the um, Internal Review Board that helps us do those things ethically. And uh, so there's a lot of paperwork involved in that too, actually, but it's a great question, yeah. Um, our next question comes from Steph, who's joining us online. Um, so I was really shocked when you talked about the photogrammetry, like mm, it was yeah. a very unexpected aspect of archaeology. But she'd like to know what are some other cool tools that you use that you maybe didn't mention, or some of the other yeah pieces. Oh my gosh, we are so one thing you all should know about archaeologists is like we're we're real like um, gear nerds, right? We love gear, we love technology. Um, uh, things that I haven't used, but I would love to, but that I know other archaeologists are making use of um, is drone technology. Drones are a huge sort of movement in archaeology. You can get aerial shots uh, and it is used in photogrammetry too, actually. It helps you get a much um, sort of bigger picture. It helps you record larger landscapes. Uh, and photogrammetry is done on the artifact scale too. But um, I, what I did was close range. I didn't have a drone. So um, I, I did close range photogrammetry. So all of the photos that were taken for that, I took with either like a monopod or myself on the ground. Um, so you can do it actually without, without, the, without the drone technology. But people are doing cool things with drones. Um, LIDAR is a fascinating um, method that a lot of archaeologists are using. Um, sort of the really like too long, don't read version of that is uh, it's, it's an aerial form of imaging that uses lasers to cut through vegetation and see what's happening on the, on the ground. And um, lots of archaeologists are using this, for example, in the, um, in the rain areas where that are highly forested or rainforests um, to, uh, you know, discover whole cities. Um, you can look up one of my colleagues at Ithaca College, Thomas Garrison, um, does some really cool stuff with LIDAR and um, Maya cities. So, that's cool. Um, and then for me, I actually, I used iPads in the field and I loved that. Um, I'm not the first one to do it. I used iPads almost 10 years ago um, on Rebecca Bria's project, the PR project in, um, in Peru, but it's digital field data collection in the field. You can kind of skip over. We used papers too, but we used iPads to take videos, to document artifacts, to take notes. And that, that's a big growing trend too. There's so many others I could talk about, but I'll leave you guys with those. I think that's so great um, because all of these similar technologies are be being used in different fields for different purposes, mm -hmm. but then it's not, LIDAR is not exclusively, um, no. you know, climate type. like I've seen it used when I was up in the Arctic. And so now it's so cool to hear it's also being used in archaeology that there's all this cross-pollination. Um, so I'm going to give our next question to Tiger, who's joining us um, live on the call. So Tiger, if you're ready, go ahead and unmute and ask Trisha a question. Um, so, uh, when examining uh, different sites, how do you um, look at certain objects and the sites themselves? How do you preserve them? Um, mm -hmm. That's a great question. It's one of the central questions because as archaeologists, we're very interested in preservation. Um, one thing I didn't mention sort of in our overview of archaeology is that we're very concerned about the preservation of sites, but archaeology is destructive. When you take, when you dig, when you take something out of the ground, you can't put it back, which is why we are a scientific discipline, which is why we record things. Um, it's actually a bit tedious. We're definitely not like running from boulders most of the time. But um, objects and preservation is, is a big question too. Uh, and this is contextual depending on the site that you're at, the environment that you're working in. 
um, in the time period that you're working in. Um, so you're going to face different challenges with faunal remains or, or bones from, you know, thousands of years ago versus sort of historic materials or metals from just about 100 years ago. So we have all different types of processes for preserving things. Um, we have different processes for preserving metal, which obviously corrodes and, and rusts. Uh, and there's other processes too. Underwater archaeologists deal a lot with um, preservation because things that are preserved underwater will actually disintegrate upon reaching the air. So uh, that doesn't really answer your question, Tiger, because we could go into this at such length, but I just want to say that it's an important question, um, and this ties into all the work that we do after the field um, to making sure that things are preserved and cataloged and bagged properly in archival bags uh, and studied. And sometimes we 3D scan them um, and create replicas or digital models if we can't handle them directly to, to help with preservation. Um, so uh, that answers your question a little bit. But if you want to chat more about it, um, I have all types of things you could look into about that. Yeah, I feel like we're just, with all of this, this is just our little intro, scratch the surface. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I have a question from a student who's joining us from Ms. Hansen's um, class in Iowa. Um, do you have any examples of modern, modern archaeology helping to shape more inclusive narratives of the past? Yes, um, I love that question. Thank you for that question. Um, first, uh, you know, I maybe will share my slide again, if that's okay, just because I include some examples of, of this work being done that I think are really great. Um, and I'm gonna go back to, let's see, this slide in the very beginning, um, because I wanted to talk more about these, pro uh, these projects. And now I can. Um, so I think a lot of archeologists are doing this. Many archeologists are thinking about this in their work. Um, the, my very good friend Katie Sieber is doing archaeology with the Mitchellville Freedom Park project. I encourage you to look them up. They actually have talks that they give on the public. It's a broad community based, um, you know, archaeology project looking at Gullah history in this area um, on Hilton Head Island. Uh, and there's a lot of questions about tourism and the impacts on heritage and climate change as well on these small islands that are that are being impacted. Um, and she does incredible work. I could send you a blog post about what she does. Um, Archaeology in the community um, and, and Dr. Alexandra Jones is really working on projects. Um, it's less about excavation, but more about bringing archaeological knowledge to the community, um, particularly kids, right, which I think is really important. Um, and I think that's transformative in, in a lot of ways. Um, and Dr. Engman's work is so cool. It's actually in Ghana, um, and it's sort of an autobiographical archaeology project. Um, please go read about her work. She's doing a community archaeology project at the um, Christiansburg uh, Castle, actually, in, in this area, which has a really complicated history with, um, you know, Europeans coming in and the slave trade and um, how the communities are connected to this space that's actually very difficult and how her own personal history is connected to this space. So I just wanted to highlight those three. Um, I also, uh, I, I like to highlight, we haven't had a chance to talk about it. I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, but my, um, a lot of contemporary archeology span work is addressing this stuff directly. Um, so you can look at Jason de Leon's Undocumented Migration Project, um, which is actually looking at the contemporary archaeology of the U.S.-Mexico border. And um, it's, it's a very difficult thing to study and um, a difficult present for us to learn about, but very necessary. And I think that his work is very um, transformative in that way, directly connecting to a lot of the conversations that we have. Um, and there's other work too being done at, at refugee camps um, worldwide. Um, you can look into the work of Yanis Hamalakis. Um, I could probably list more, but I don't wanna go on for too long. Um, but if, again, if you would like to direct message me, I could connect you with any number of projects that are happening um, worldwide, really. Yeah, so many great starts and kind of, um, I'll definitely make sure to retweet out um, using the hashtag Explorer Classroom, some of these resources. So I think people right. had a chance to screenshot them, but we'll also kind of follow up through Instagram and through Twitter um, using Explorer Classroom to get some of these things. Summer's here, time to look into some new stuff. Yeah, do it. It's exciting. 
So a very specific question about um, from Cindy, wondering if you have any information or if you know about a site that was found in San Antonio, San Antonio, the Hockley Clay Cemetery. It was a black cemetery found underneath the school. I know Texas is big, but. Is. <laughs> yes, and I don't have, so I, I have heard of it. I can't give you any specific information. I'm not the expert on that. Um, but gosh, I mean, there's, um, I recently worked on a, a special issue. It's sort of scholarly publication. Um, but one of the things that we we look at there, I mean, black history is is really under recognized in the American West and the Southwest in particular. So sites like that are incredibly important. Um, and I'm excited actually to learn more about it. So I'm glad that you brought it up um, and I'm gonna look more into it myself. Uh, but yeah, and I know a lot of people who are Texas archeologists who could probably tell you at length about that. Um, and I could connect you with them too, but I'm glad that you brought it up here. Thank you. So I'm gonna throw a one kind of final question for you to wax poetic and mic drop and kind of give you our final, <laughs> to kind of retouch on a lot. You know, you can go back to key, some key themes, but what really struck me in the beginning when you were talking about what archeology span is and what it is not, so it's not Indiana Jones and it's not dinosaurs, mm, yeah. <laughs> but it's the thing that we make and it's not over, it's still ongoing and it's connected to power. Mm -hmm. um, with that all in mind, you know, currently we're in a global pandemic. We also have global activism, uh, civic activism around systemic racism. You know, how can students, you know, at the student high school level right now, take action and be allies in co-creating this, their history and this history of today? Yeah, and that is such a great question. And really, I'm glad we're ending on this because this is really the most important takeaway here, right? Um, how to, oh, good. So this is just we'll yeah. keep talking and then I'll kind of perfect. Finish. I was like, oh, I thought I did something. No. Um, there are so many good ways. Um, I think this question of how how can we be good citizens and good allies in particular, right, um, at this moment in time is so important. Um, and you know, from an archaeological perspective, I'm going to re-highlight that idea of of reading about the past, um, of educating yourself, of kind of pushing yourself beyond your comfort zone. And I, I want to highlight too that a lot about our past is very difficult. It's uncomfortable. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of violence there. Uh, and this relates directly to some of the anger or most of the anger that we see today. It's important for us to recognize and it can be uncomfortable to learn about, but I would encourage students, especially to get used to sitting with discomfort and really seeing it as a way to grow, right? To, to not, to lean into opportunities to learn about things that, that can be quite difficult. Um, in terms of being an ally, I think there's lots of active things you can do. Um, obviously, you can you can read up, you can have conversations, you can donate if you're able to, you can protest if you can do so safely. But I think that the key to allyship too is is not the overt actions, right? It's about looking at ourselves and our daily our daily existence, our daily lives, what we're doing, um, and working on being an ally in the quiet moments, right? The ones that we aren't necessarily recognized for. And I think that, uh, you know, learning about diverse pasts is important for that. Um, working on listening skills, being able to really listen, to sit and listen and understand what other people are saying, and also develop critical thinking skills and critical reading skills to be able to enter into conversations with the information that you see um, and, and really push back against taking things at face value. Um, and so I think those give you a good foundation for, for good allyship. Um, and then it, it's important to, you know, um, read diverse voices, read black authors, um, look at archaeology being done by black archaeologists and archaeologists of color. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a good path to walk on and you guys are in a good position to do it as, as high school students right now. Mm -hmm. And on that note, again, this is just the beginning. Let's keep this yes. conversation going. Um, you can follow Trish on Instagram at Field Notes from Texas, send her DMs of questions, um, continue, you know, ask for links to places to follow up and find out more. You can see she's a wealth of resources. Um, we're also interested in hearing your thoughts at Nat Geo Education on Twitter and following the hashtag Explore Classroom. Well, this is our final high school edition of Explore Classroom because school's out for summer. Um, learning's not over. Our 2 p.m. regular broadcasts will continue and there's going to be some other kind of summer camp enrichment opportunities um, that will continue as um, we continue. Um, and then yeah, and Tiger's just saying he's been doing, we'll, we'll connect in a little bit. He's found yeah. some 
issues. So um, thank you everyone for joining us. I'm gonna unmute. Um, let's all unmute and say thank you so much and goodbye. Bye everybody, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for joining in and thank you Kim and Tiger.